Um, so, thanks everyone for coming to this session, which has nothing on the screen. That's also a problem. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned before, this is a BP adjudication seminar, and I guess the thing to start with is BP adjudication is really complex, and it's also really complex to explain how to adjudicate a debate, particularly a BP debate. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is just give you guys a bit of a framework for how to approach uh, these kinds of debates uh, and some tactics to use, but ultimately the only way to really learn how to do this is by doing it again and again and again. Um, but So that's the disclaimer if you find this totally useless. So, now that's sorted. Uh, this is the way I'm going to be structuring this. So we're going to do a very quick review of BP just because some of you may not have done much of the style before, slash many of you haven't done it for a year. Uh, then we're going to look at some of the unique factors to consider in BP adjudication. Uh, then look at the, uh, consensus adjudication and scoring. Um, and I guess the thing to say is we want the session to be as interactive as possible. So if you have any comments, totally disagree with me, whatever, uh, just please put up your hand and I may listen to you. Cool. All right, review of BP format. Going to make this as quick as possible because this is diabolically boring. Um, the number of teams, as you might guess from this slide, is four. <laughs> what, <laughs> uh, what are the four teams? What do these carefully craft crafted acronyms actually mean? Um, Andrew, can you can you give a brief explanation of how the style works for everyone who's forgotten? All of it. Okay. Go. <laughs> we believe in empowering our young kids. Go for it, man. So just to briefly interrupt you there, so say for example we have a topic uh, that this house supports invading Zimbabwe, you'll have two teams on the government side, um, two teams on the government side that supports invading and two teams on the opposition side that are against, right? And the thing is all the teams are competing with each other because you have a ranking from one to four and so there's a top team and there's a bottom team and a second and third team, okay? So that's the difference from the three on three style which obviously has one team on either side. Okay, so that should be fairly straightforward. Um, what about the speaking time? You're, you're a clever man. Um, and can you speak? Can you speak over time? Right. So the rule of thumb at a tournament like Worlds, which I think is what you guys want to be really focusing on, is about 15 seconds you can get away with. Any more than that, you can actually get quite heavily penalized. Right? So try as much as you can to stick to seven minutes. So basically, for any of you who don't know, you'll start speaking. There'll be a clap after one minute. Um, after that one minute, you may be asked a point of information, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, and then there's another clap at six minutes, uh, which, is, which signals another protected minute, and after which you should wrap up. Uh, but that should hopefully make sense to most of you. Um, have, does, is that confusing to any of you? Have any of you not seen a BP debate, I suppose, in terms of those real basics? Just so we can go through it in more detail. No? Okay. Um, points of information we'll cover later. Um, extensions. Can someone briefly explain to me, what's an extension? Exactly. Right. So for those of you who haven't seen the style much, basically, as I've mentioned before, there's four teams. The opening two teams will present a case, and then the closing teams on each side present an extension, which is a new contribution to the debate. Right? So if you're the closing government, you're providing a new contribution to the government side of that topic, which is meant to distinguish yourself from the opening, which is already made argument. Okay? That's the basics. We'll come to that later. The adjudication process, only thing I want to mention here is that this is a consensus adjudication process. Um, so if you have a panel of three people, uh, you'll 
work together, talk through the decision, and come to a consensus, which is different from Austral style, where you just uh, sit there, uh, work out your decision, and hand over your ballot, uh, and you often have split decisions in that process. Okay, we'll come to that in more detail later. All right, so holistic decision making. I've decided to start talking more like an Oxford wanker this semester. So holistic was the beginning of that. Okay. Uh, no, I just need. No, no. No, no, it'll be an Indian accent. Um, <laughs> so, okay, this is, this is basically a bit of an overarching slide. The key thing to remember with BP, just in terms of how you approach adjudication, is don't approach it in a really rigid way. So in Austral style, you'll often say, you know, what are the three big issues in the debate? One, two, three, who won this issue? Who won this issue? That team is the winner, right? BP is much more flexible. There's a range of additional factors which you have to consider which influence a decision, right? So that's just a way of approaching the debate. Um, and the second thing to note, right, is that all of the factors I've noted there, so style, which is the way you speak, uh, content or your matter, and the strategy are all in interdependent, right? So they all influence each other. So if you have a really persuasive speaking style, that's something that's actually really important to British parliamentary, right? Because it influences how persuasive your content is. Okay, so it's important not to look at all of these different factors that you have to weigh up in isolation. Okay? So there's a number of unique factors to consider in British parliamentary style. There's role fulfillment, there's extensions, and there's points of information, which are things you wouldn't consider if you're adjudicating an Austral debate. Okay? So just so you know how we're going to progress with this, what I'm going to do is go through all of these factors individually, and then we'll have a slide where we try and bring them all together and give you an approach for how to integrate all of these quite amorphous factors, just like role fulfillment. Okay, so let's get into it. Role fulfillment. Um, question one, what does role fulfillment refer to? And don't say fulfilling roles. Okay. Uh, yeah, good euphemism. Um, that, that's certainly true. Um, but I suppose the more significant thing in British parliamentary adjudication is the extent to which each team completes their role. So you're certainly right in that each individual speaker uh, on all of the teams has a specific role, right? But when you're evaluating the whole debate, you're looking at whether all the teams fulfill their particular role. So what that means, we need to establish what's expected of each of the different teams, because this is the starting point you're going to be use, using when you determine whether a team has fulfilled their role. So, Opening government, right? The first thing which is really crucial in terms of the opening government's role is how well they set up the debate. So what do I mean by that? What are the kind of things you'd look for as an adjudicator in terms of setting up the debate? Okay, a clear context, number one. Yep, what else? A clear model, okay. So it's all the classic problem solution stuff which we drummed into you guys in first semester, right? a clear problem, a clear issue which justifies action, right? And a solution which reflects that problem, right? However, it's important to note that not every debate requires a model, right? So in British parliamentary style in particular, you often get a lot of more principled topics, right? Something like, is torture justified, okay? So if you're doing a topic, is torture justified, you don't necessarily need to propose a model saying, we would use torture in these situations on these individuals in this way, right? You could talk about it as a principle, right? The principle is that torture is justified and is appropriate. So you don't always need a practical policy solution, okay? So just as adjudicators, you want to be wary of basically requiring a model in every situation in determining whether an opening government has done their job. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. The other thing to note about the opening government is the degree of flexibility which they have in setting up the debate. Um, can anyone tell me what I mean by that? Can you explain to me my thoughts? So what happens, I think, much more commonly with British parliamentary style is quite open topics, right? So instead of always saying, 
we should invade Zimbabwe. There might be a topic about, you know, the West must take action to protect individuals from human rights abuses or something like that, right? And you have a lot of flexibility as the opening government in BP style in terms of how you define that, right? Whether you want to go really narrow and focus on a specific situation or go really, really broad, okay? And it's important to remember that in BP adjudication, opening governments are meant to have a lot of flexibility. So as an adjudicator, it should be very, very rare situations that you penalize an opening government for defining a topic in a particular way, right? We'll come to that a bit later, but a definition that's not unreasonable, even if it's unconventional, is totally fine in British parliamentary, okay? So there's the setup, right? The next dimension is uh, depth of analysis and engagement, classic debating mumbo jumbo words. Um, in terms of analysis, you're obviously looking at the quality of the argument, right? To what extent are those arguments both true and important to the debate, right? True and important, they're the two questions that you want to be looking at with really any argument, right? But the other specific thing is engagement, okay? So who's going to be engaging in this debate with speakers from the other team in the opening government? Which speaker? The, no, but who's uh, the person on the government side that's going to be doing it? The Deputy Prime Minister, right? So the Prime Minister, of course, you can't penalise for not rebutting. But the Deputy Prime Minister is the only one with the opportunity to directly rebut the, the opening opposition, right? So that's going to be really, really crucial. So when you're analysing the opening government in your adjudication, you ought to look very closely at what the Deputy Prime Minister does, right? Firstly, do they add something new in terms of argumentation, but also do they rebut the opposition leader, which is really, really crucial to them fulfilling their role, okay? And then the third thing here is staying relevant, okay? So the big disadvantage for an opening government team is that, of course, they're finished after the first 20 minutes of the debate, right? And they have to just sit there while all the other teams go at it, right? So when you're talking about staying relevant, what are you looking for? Okay, absolutely, right? So a good opening government team will be asking lots of points of information to the opposition and will be trying to reference some of their really good arguments which either haven't gotten a response or putting a new spin on them to make them seem central to the debate uh, during the end of the debate. Okay? One thing though I think is very important on I guess a higher level is it's quite unfair to penalise an opening government team for not being relevant if speakers on the other side aren't taking their points of information. Right? So if, for example, a closing opposition team simply isn't willing to accept any of their points, it's a bit unfair to say that they didn't stay in the debate. So that's something as an adjudicator you have to factor in, the, the extent to which a team got shut out of the debate. Okay? The other thing you have to consider in terms of whether they stayed relevant is the arguments themselves. Right? Were the principles, were the arguments set up in the opening government the kind of thing that was talked about at the end of the debate? Did those issues continue to reverberate through the debate? Okay? And it's very, I think, particularly in relation to opening government, it's really important to be conscious of this role fulfillment issue. Because at the end of the day, it's quite hard as an opening government to look really impressive when you had all these other good speakers after them. So you need to be analysing them on the basis they had very little time to prepare. Have they set up a strong, clear case which remained relevant till the end? And if so, you should reward them for that. Okay? Does anyone have any questions about opening government? No? Okay. Opening opposition. Um, this is fairly brief because it's pretty similar to the opening government. Um, the key thing you want to be thinking though is do they have a clear stance? So what do I mean by a clear stance as an opposition? And what does that mean? Absolutely, right? So it's in the same way we look at an opening government and consider that problem-solution issue, it's exactly the same for the opposition, right? What's their position on the problem that's been identified by the affirmative? Are they supporting keeping the current system or proposing a new system? And if that's, so, uh, that's true, to what extent have they established that new alternative model? Right. Well, we'll come to that a little bit later, but an interesting and kind of weird nuance of British parliamentary is there's 
slightly different rules for closing government and closing opposition. Because it's based in a parliamentary system, the closing government is meant to have to be more consistent. Like you actually have to defend ultimately the opening's line, right? But on the opposition bench, right, the opening opposition and the closing opposition are tra treated as two separate opposition parties, right, who might have different reasons for opposing. So while you can't get up there at closing opposition and say the opening opposition's policy was terrible, you don't have to spend a lot of time defending it either. Right? It's a weird nuance. I'm sure that probably sounds a bit confusing, but that's the way they look at it at will. Okay. Um, so I guess the only the final thing I'd say with with opening opposition is when you're looking at this um, you know stance and their problem solution, the key thing is clarity. Right? A lot of opening oppositions simply won't be clear about what it is they want, and that undermines the whole debate. So a big element of role fulfillment right, is having that clear approach to the problem which is understandable by, uh, by all the other teams. Okay. All right, so that's the opening half. And just as a bit of a judging tip, it's often useful to be thinking, once the opening half is finished, which team you think is ahead at this stage, right? And obviously that might change with things like points of information, but it's often good to get in your head who's leading at that point, because that might be the case at the end. Okay, closings. So I'll be brief here because I'm going to look at extensions in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, so one crucial element of role fulfillment is obviously the extension, probably the most important thing for closing teams to do. Right? And we'll look at that in a second. But another thing that's really important, I think uh, doesn't get enough focus, is engagement with the other teams in the debate. Right? So the closing government has to engage both with the opening opposition um, and the final speaker, the government whip, has to engage uh, with the closing opposition, right? And that's really, really crucial. So when you're taking your notes in the debate, make sure you remember to look at whether that person has actually rebutted what has come out earlier in the debate, right? And it doesn't need to be every single issue because it's unrealistic for any closing team to have to go through the whole opening half again. But the key points have to be addressed if they want to fulfill their role. Okay? Um, the only other thing I'd say is... Consistency. Um, what do I mean by consistency in relation to the closing government? What do they have to do? Okay. And what does Narkin mean? Right. Okay. So that often leads to a little bit of an awkward tension, which is what um, what Dior was referring to. Because if you have an opening team which runs something pretty crazy, it can be a little bit difficult to disentangle yourself from that. Right. I think the best bet is as far as possible not to ever use any language contradicting the team, but just pushing different arguments that are more reasonable. Right? It's a pretty tough balance, but adjudicators uh, should be factoring that in when they're evaluating the teams. Okay? So you don't want to be penalizing a closing government for having to be consistent with a really bad opening. Right? Does that make sense? So you have to recognize, I guess, the context in which that team was once they made their case. Okay. So extensions. This is the this is the meat. Actually, sorry. One last thing. Um, what's the deal with new material? To what extent can closing teams bring out new material? Um, uh, sorry, our closing teams being the whip speakers on both teams. Okay. The whip. That's exactly right. I mean, there's a slight difference between the government whip and the opposition whip. So the opposition whip strictly can't bring out new material. Okay, and that's something you've got to be have to be very conscious of when you're adjudicating. The government whip in the rules is allowed to bring out new material, but it's generally discouraged. So generally at world's briefings they'll say that the government whip shouldn't bring out new material. Right? So it's something that I would say if the government whip ends up doing it in a debate you're adjudicating, don't like say, we can't consider this material at all, but you wouldn't give it the same weight as it came out earlier. Right? And that makes sense, I think, from a perspective of just getting more air time in the debate. Right? If something comes out so late, it's hard for it to be a really significant, crucial, debate-winning issue. Okay? So the bulk of the material should be coming out from the, uh, from the member speeches. Okay? Does anyone have any uh, questions about those basic the basic summary of the roles. 
extensions. All right, so this is the probably the most challenging element of BP adjudicating, but I also think the most interesting. Um, so, okay, so I've, I've begun this slide by saying the test, and this is what, um, you know, is the general rule at, at Wells. Um, they might use different language from year to year, but the test is whether a closing team has, has brought forward a substantial and distinctive contribution to the debate. Okay? Substantial and distinctive contribution to the debate. And so, one thing I need to be, I guess, very clear about here is that doesn't mean that they need to be talking about something totally different to what has come before, right? So in a debate about the UN invading Zimbabwe, you don't have to bring up an extension about like the impact on Chad or whatever to have an extension, right? You can talk about something which has already been mentioned in the debate, but has been insufficiently analyzed. Okay, does that make sense to people? And another really strong th uh, thing that the good teams do at Worlds is they'll look at the opening half of the debate, they'll see that there's been a real issue of contention in the debate that hasn't been resolved, and they'll say, at closing, we're going to resolve this issue. We're going to explain this particular link in the argument which hasn't been explained. Okay? And so this is a little bit amorphous without seeing a debate. Hopefully when you see the exhibition debates, you'll get what I mean. But really, really crucial not to lapse into the mentality that if it isn't a totally different argument, it's not an extension, right? Provided you think that the analysis is distinctive, substantial, really adds to the debate, even if it's on a similar issue, that's totally cool, okay? And the reason I mention that is I think Australian adjudicators have traditionally taken a much harsher approach to what an extension is, which is fine, but if once you get to worlds, you'll see it's much, much more flexible. So I think we should be building towards worlds as our main focus. Okay, so the other thing I want to mention there in terms of rebuttal, another thing inexperienced uh, speakers often do is they kind of try and separate rebuttal and argument in this really rigid way, right? So they'll say, well, you spent four minutes talking about your extension, it wasn't that new, but you had some interesting new pieces of rebuttal, but that wasn't enough, right? That's a problem because rebuttal can be enough to be an extension. Right? So even if it isn't flagged as an extension in itself, right? even if the flagged extension is quite crap, if the rebuttal is new and interesting and tackles a central issue in the debate, that can be enough. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? I think that's really, really crucial. There's no rigid divide between rebuttal and argument in world star. Um, I've already mentioned the types of extensions, so you can have a new argument, and look, if there is one on the table, which is an important stakeholder that hasn't been analysed, absolutely you should reward that, right, and penalise opening teams for failing to do that material. But just be wary of, uh, I guess, cutting out the deeper analysis extension automatically. Okay, do people have any questions about extensions? No, well, you could, strictly speaking, and the reason for that is, in, in world style, um, the structure is something that isn't quite as significant. The reason for that is that Canadians have a totally different way of structuring their arguments. British speakers often have a totally different way of structuring their arguments. So you don't need to frame it as, this is my extension and this is my rebuttal, right? Having said that, you're probably detracting from your persuasiveness if you're not clear about what your new material is. So as a judge, I'd say, factor in the fact that there's not that clarity about what the material is, but at the same time, if the good analysis is there, you still gotta give it the same credit as if it was within that label. Okay? All right, points of information. So I've written the word holistic on my page. I don't know what that was meant to mean. Um, so <laughs> points of information are really crucial, right? And I think one trap that some inexperienced adjudicators fall into is they just see them as this bit of this sideshow that just kind of floats around the debate. They don't really know what to do with them, right? Points of information are there because they demonstrate engagement with the debate, right? They allow teams, often the opening teams, to stay involved, to keep their material relevant, right? They're very strategic. So. I've, I've broken it down to, into asking questions and answering questions. In terms of the quality of a point of information, what are the kind of things you'd think about 
in terms of whether a particular point is a good point of information. Okay, clarity about what's being asked. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right, there's two possibilities. Yeah. What else? Yeah, absolutely. You want to be thinking often of point of information quite similar to the way you'd evaluate an argument. Right? or a piece of rebuttal. Right? Is it logical? Is it relevant? But the extra dimension to points of information are, of course, the strategic dimension. Right? Is If an opening team asks a really good point of information about their material to a closing, that can be quite important, in me meaning that their material stays relevant for longer. And as an adjudicator, you should reward that. Right? Um, what about in terms of the form of the question? Right, in terms of the way they're phrased and the way they're explained. Yeah. The absolute best of points of information, I think, are really short and punchy, like probably no more than 10 seconds, which is obviously quite difficult. Right? But you want one idea that you can hit a speaker with. Okay? So that's the kind of thing you're going to be looking at. Because if someone's asking a really confusing point of information, it's quite fair for a speaker not to really engage with it properly. right? Because when something's really confusing or there's a compound question, it's quite difficult for a speaker to be able to really deal with that. I suppose. I mean, I, like, I think a fact is fine. I don't think there's a strict rule on fact versus question. It all depends on how relevant that is. And I guess if it's just a fact, it may not be immediately clear what the relevance is. That, that depends, I think, on the situation. Okay? The other thing is in terms of frequency. How often should a team be asking points of information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I think a general rule of thumb is Every speaker, around about every 15 or 20 seconds, I think, um, is, is probably about right. Um, and the key thing is, I think, in terms of how you practically put this into place when you're adjudicating, it's worth having a little table or something like that where you note down the number of points of information that get, get asked. Um, and that's because it's often really hard to keep track of when teams are asking points of information. But I think it's really worth keeping a handle on that because that's something that can undermine uh, the extent to which a particular team engages with the debate and undermine their effectiveness. Okay, what about... Yeah, sure. I mean, I would, I'd probably penalise that in terms of speaker points, but I mean, like, ultimately it undermines the team as well, right? Because the team's meant to be a unit, they're both meant to be engaging, um, but in terms of the actual scores, you'd probably reflect that in the speaker points. Yeah. Um, okay, in terms of answering questions, how many questions should be answered per team? Or annual question? Right. So the rule of thumb at the moment at Worlds is that there should be three across a team, right? So it's okay for a speaker to only take one point if their teammate takes two. That's a little bit in flux because it seems to change a little bit every now and then. I would say... As an adjudicator, it's worth really penalising a team which takes only two points, or takes less than two in particular, largely because it's a massive cop-out, right? It's basically ensuring that, you, that an opening team, for example, gets shut out of the debate, doesn't have an opportunity to actually engage with you at all, right? So there's an issue in terms of the number taken per team, but there's also an issue in terms of who's taken, right? It can be really, really problematic if a team like totally refuses to answer questions from that really strong Sydney A team, for example, right? That's the kind of thing that you should be factoring in your adjudication because it's pretty bloody obvious when it happens, right? Ideally, if you're taking like three points, you should be taking w at least, well, you have to take one from, from each team, okay? Um, the next thing is in terms of style of answering questions and what are you looking for there as an adjudicator? You want people to be able to be composed and articula articulate in their responses. But also, I think what's really important is actually answering the question, right? 
What's really bad is when speakers dodge things by saying, I'll look at this at some point in the future of my speech and then don't, right? So that's the kind of thing which is really important, I think, in terms of manner. Okay. Um, and also the tactical benefits of being there. I mean, I think it's not a bad idea at all. It depends on your positioning in the debate. So if you want to try, if you believe that you're trying to get first place against a really strong team, it probably makes sense to engage with them as much as possible, um, but maybe not depending on the situation. Yeah. was the least scary person in the world. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, realistically, I don't think it's a huge deal which, um, which person is taken by each individual, provided that across the team, you're taking both different teams and you're not consciously shutting out the stronger team. Yeah. Okay, mana. I'm not going to say a huge amount for this because obviously this will be similar to the way you adjudicate... Um, Austral style. The one thing I'd say is the extra dimension of BP manner is how you handle POIs, right? So the key, key factor is having control over the room, right? Not feeling really pressured to take POIs mid-sentence, having that capacity to slow down, to choose your moment when you want to take the POI, and to actually have the time to answer them. Um, other thing I'd say is that manner is something that gets ignored way, way, way too much by adjudicators in general, I think. But in BP, you just can't do that. Like, strictly speaking, under, this, under the rules of the style, manner is worth 50 points um, out of 100. But even putting that aside, it's something that's really crucial. If everything is equal but one team had a massive manner advantage, they should win. Right? That should be a crucial factor in tipping you over. Okay? So I think in terms of how you practically implement this, it's worth maybe having a little section on your sheet for each speaker with manner and just like, you know, very good, or if something was really bad, just note it down just to keep that in your mind, because you don't want to let mana totally slip out of your mind in BP judging. I think it's a little bit context dependent. I mean, I feel that if no one's been offering at all, um, and you feel like you have to ask, that's cool. But if people have been offering pretty consistently and you need to basically break stride and ask for a POI, that's pretty unnatural and probably isn't great manner, I don't think. So it really depends on how active the other teams are. Generally, you should be in a position where, based on the rhythm of how many times the other team's standing up, you're in a good position to take one when you want to. Yeah, exactly. And leave people standing, right? I think that's probably the better from a manner perspective. Yeah. Okay. Any other manner questions? Okay, putting it all together. So, so far we've looked at some of those unique factors that go into BP. Okay, so we've looked at uh, role fulfillment, we've looked at evaluating the arguments, we've looked at mana, we've looked at POIs and how active the teams were. Okay, so these are all the different factors, but the question is how do you put this all together when you actually approach a decision, right? Which is a pretty difficult task. Okay, the way I see it is when you're making your decision, as you go along through the debate, you want to be analyzing each, each team through the prism of these questions, right? You want to be looking at, to what extent did they fulfill their role? To what extent were they active, asking POIs, answering POIs, right? To what extent were their arguments strong, as you do in any debate, right? So those are the kind of questions you want to be considering. But that's not enough in itself, right? Because after you do this stage of the analysis, you'll have, you know, opening government had good role fulfillment, but their arguments were a little bit weak on this. Or closing opposition had a good extension but didn't rebut the closing government. Like, where do you go from there, is the question, right? And the answer to that is taking a comparative approach. So every time you analyze a particular team, you want to be analyzing them against the other teams in the debate. So if you're looking at the closing opposition, don't look at them in isolation. Consider whether you think their extension was stronger than the closing government's extension, which would mean that they fulfilled their role better. 
right? And if you're considering the opening teams in the same way, consider which team had a clearer and stronger stance and contrast that, right? But obviously, that doesn't necessarily help you if you're trying to contrast the closing opposition and the opening government, right? Which have totally different roles. So how do you think you could do that? How do you try and compare teams which are like, you know, across the board from each other and have totally different roles? What would you do? So a closing off an opening government. How do you compare them? Right. Exactly. Okay. So to some extent, you can compare the teams based on their direct interactions with each other, right? So maybe the closing opposition asked a POI to the opening government or rebutted a particular point from the opening government in a particular way. But obviously, that's not necessarily going to be enough, right? Particularly if, uh, you know, you had two teams on the same bench, right, which didn't actually engage against each other, right? So that means you have to go back to these questions, right? Which team was better at their role fulfillment, which team was more persuasive in their argumentation, right? And you have to weigh these factors up, right, and determine which team was stronger than the other team, right? Which is a pretty difficult task, but I think the key thing to remember is you're always evaluating these factors, right, and comparing the teams and how well they fit this matrix, okay? And, and the other thing I'd mention is you want to be taking a fluid approach so there's no single reason why a team wins or loses, right? A closing government can have a pretty average extension and still win the debate, right? It's not as if role fulfillment is worth 60 points and manner is worth 40 points and you add the points up and that's how you get the winner, right? The ultimate question in any debate is which team is most persuasive and the way you evaluate persuasiveness is all of these factors, right? Did they fulfill their role? Were they active? Did they ask good questions? So, that's probably going to be quite difficult, once again, to put in practice until you actually do these debates, right? But you want to be, always be thinking, which teams met these standards, and how do they compare against each other in meeting these standards? So the next thing in this slide is structuring a BP adjudication, delivering an oral adjudication. So how would you go about doing that? Perfect, that's absolutely right. And the thing I'd stress um, on this point, guys, is this should be a pro forma approach to delivering adjudications. And it's not the kind of thing we'd say normally, but at Worlds, there's a very clear approach which is always consistent. You start by saying the order, one, two, three, four, then you say, this team finished first because of this, this is the reason why they beat team two, right? So see how you're directly contrasting them? This is why team two directly beat team three. Oh, you, can, you can do that as well. I mean, I generally prefer going from the start uh, down to the bottom because I think exposing the weaknesses in that way is strong. But uh, it, it doesn't really matter. Either way, the key thing is that you're directly comparing each team against each other. Okay? Um, and that's when all of the stuff we've looked at is going to be informing your analysis. Okay? So, any questions on this kind of big picture stuff? Sorry, not too vague. Wavelengths. Okay, so for people who have done uh, consensus adjudication before, how does it work? What have you guys can tell me? 
absolutely right. So ultimately, every member of the panel comes up with a particular order. They discuss that order. Hopefully and generally, they come to a consensus. The thing to note is that in some situations, it might go to a vote if there are irreconcilable differences over particular spots or whatever. Right? That's not very common. Generally, you come to a consensus, I think, at least in my experience. Um, so just building on what was, what was said just then, in terms of, I think we'll start with paneling, actually, paneling effectively. Um, the point that Linton made was really good, right? You have to be open to make concessions. So even though you have your order, it's very possible and quite likely that other people will disagree with your order, right? So, but having said that, another thing that I think is really important for inexperienced adjudicators is don't just roll over if you really believe a particular team did better, right? If you really think a particular team was first and some other panelist thinks they were fourth, right? You're really undermining your role by just saying, okay, no worries, you, you look a bit older than me, whatever, right? You want to be backing up your arguments, but within limits, right? Of course, at some point, you might get to the point in your adjudication where you're not getting anywhere with that argument, the other two are much stronger on that, right? And you might need to give up that fight. But what you can do in that situation is trade off positions, right? So you can say, okay, if you, you know, I don't think this team did that well, but if we're willing to put that team higher, I'd only be willing to agree with that if another team did worse, or something like that, right? So if you really believe strongly about a couple of different positions, you may have to trade off getting one of the things you want for getting something else you want. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, maybe not, although I adjudicate. Um, so in terms of chairing effectively, um, so I'm sure many of you will be chairing awesome panels at Worlds soon, if you haven't already. Um, I think the first step is asking your panelists for, for their order, right? You want to get all three orders down straight away, right? And as Finn suggested before, that means you can, you can make the process really efficient. So if everyone agrees a particular team is fourth, don't bother discussing them. That team is fourth, right? You may discuss them a little bit later when you're giving feedback or whatever, right? But that team is out. Or if everyone agrees another team is first, right? That's fine, that's locked in. And then you can have the debate about second and third. Okay? So you want to try and streamline the process as much as possible. And in terms of discussion, you want to give it you know, like 10, 15 minutes, depending on the tournament. But at some point, if you're not getting anywhere, you may need to put it to a vote. And that's a reality. Okay? So make sure that both your panelists have an opportunity to express their views, to debate each other on those views, to really go through it. But at some point, there has to be a natural limit. Okay. We're nearly there. Scoring. Okay, this is my matrix, which I think is close enough to right, but <laughs> you might get slight differences in terms of uh, in terms of different tournaments. Like the only, I'm not going to spend much time on this. The only thing, thing to remember is that in terms of scoring, the average in BP style is the same, right? So an average speech at, at Worlds is meant to be the same as an average speech at Austral's, which is 75, right? The difference is that the spread is much broader. So as you can see, a 79 at Austral's, which is one of the top few speeches at the tournament, right? you might get an 86 or an 88. right? Whereas a 72 at Austral's may be like a 67. I don't know. But the thing is, the range is much broader, and you've got to be willing to use that range. So if you think a, sp uh, a speech is really good, don't be freaked out by a number with an 8 in front of it. right? It's just the nature of the style. It goes from 50 to 100 instead of 70 to 80. Okay? 50s practically almost never happen in the same way 70s at Austral's practically never happen. Right? Um, okay, and those are my annotations, which are just random things. Um, okay, so miscellaneous advice, which is the last slide. <laughs> um, First thing, as I've already mentioned before, um, don't be too rigid. Um, and okay, um, so the first thing to note there is no automatic fourth place finishes, right? So even if a team doesn't have an extension, that doesn't mean they're automatically last. It depends on the debate, depends on the other team. Even if a team says something really, really offensive, that doesn't mean that they're automatically last. It just means that they've made a really unpersuasive argument. Right? So that's really, really crucial. And the other thing is that it's not like Austral style. So if a speaker starts with their extension for four minutes and then does rebuttal for four minutes, 
right? Don't penalize them for structure. In the same way, if a speaker has uh, their rebuttal and extension we like woven in together, they're not necessarily penalized that for that. Provided that it's clear, you can follow it, it's logical, right? That's fine. There's no strict rule as to how you have to structure a BP speech. Okay? Um, and it's the same thing with signposting. So that's the first thing to say. In terms of definitional challenges, as, I've, as we've mentioned before, they practically never happen, right? The kind of situations that would happen are really extreme, like when a, def a topic is defined as like genocide is bad or something, which is a truism, right? Something that can't be argued against, arguably. Um, or a topic is, sent, is set to like 1936, right? Those are the kind of really extreme situations, right? Where you can challenge, an opposition can challenge a definition. Generally though, the opening government gets a huge degree of flexibility and as adjudicators, you want to be reflecting that degree of flexibility. Okay, new material at WIP I've already looked at. Um, last piece of advice, um, which Madeline mentioned before, and I thought was a good point, is when you're delivering your oral adjudication, don't hide behind buzzwords like role fulfillment. Don't say this team lost because they didn't fulfill their role, the end, right? Be really specific about what element of the role they failed to fulfill and why that was significant when contrasted with all the other teams and how they fulfilled their role in this debate. Okay? That kind of specificity will really help you at Worlds. And unless there are any other questions, that's the end of the pitch.